Let us pray. Lord God, help us to listen in the dark that we may speak in the light. Help us to lay down our lives that we may gain life in you from this day forward. We pray this in your most holy name. Amen. Amen. Now, is anybody else wondering if the lectionary planners were having a bad day when they came up with the scripture selections today? <laughs> because, I mean, a few weeks ago, we had the glorious Pentecost story, and then we had the Great Commission on Trinity Sunday, and there was a nice selection of readings last week to go with our annual meeting, the apostles being sent out into the world with only the Holy Spirit in their knapsacks. But this week takes a very different turn. I think we should call it Don't Kid Yourself Sunday. A reading from Jeremiah has the prophet saying, You enticed me, O Lord, and I let myself be enticed. Ice cream Sundays are enticing. Romantic dinners are enticing. I don't think this is what Jeremiah is describing. The version of this that I grew up with has Jeremiah saying, You duped me, O Lord, and I let myself be duped. You fooled me into getting involved, God. You tricked me, and now I'm in over my head. Now, to be honest, Jeremiah the prophet does seem to have some anger management problems at times and trouble with authority, and he is often imprisoned for the challenging things God puts in his mouth. Today, he's had it with God. But it's not just Jeremiah this Sunday. I mean, the psalmist says, Surely for your sake have I suffered reproach, and shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my own kindred, an alien to my mother's children. And Jesus in Matthew's gospel isn't any help. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. And I've got to say that I was hoping for something a little more soothing today because these have been intense weeks. And their ongoing cry for racial justice and an end to police brutality, an ongoing and just cry. And we're seeing a great nationwide move towards some police reform and response, as well as newfound will for many white people to acknowledge their complicity and their involvement in racism. But that that didn't prevent Richard Brooks from being murdered by Atlanta police officers a week ago Friday. On this Sunday, after the 155th anniversary of Juneteenth, when enslaved people in Texas got the delayed news that they'd been freed, perhaps we need to call today, tell it like it is Sunday. Neither Jeremiah, nor the psalmist, nor Jesus put any sugarcoating on the consequences of being God's voice or Jesus' hands and feet in the world. They are not advertising executives. They are truth tellers. And God's people don't get a pass from the consequences of our free-range humanity. But the disciple gets a ticket right into the middle of the mess with the commission to bring with us God's word, God's good news. And that good news takes the shape of the love that we carry with us into the streets. That good news is measured by our willingness to stand with people who are in agony because of their oppression. That good news is proclaimed in the act of creating just and merciful communities. That good news is the announcement that God never leaves the struggle and we have vowed to go where God goes. And sometimes that good news feels like a painful fire in the bones. And sometimes it feels like holding on by the thinnest thread. So before we declare today, pack up and find another religion Sunday, I wanna talk about how the disciple the follower of Jesus is particularly equipped for these times. What we can do not only to endure them, but to embrace them as part of our great commission. Now in today's passage from Matthew's gospel, Jesus uses the categories that were the mark of life and death privilege in his time. The Roman power structure based on the family 
And he reminds his followers in the starkest terms that the secret to finding new life in the times that they are in requires losing the old one, the old categories. Because what you are willing to die to is directly related to how you are willing to live as a follower of Christ. What does that mean for us today? That life in Christ that we're being challenged to seek in Matthew's gospel today is not just the life that happens after the body dies. It's the life that happens after our self-centeredness dies, after our attachments die, after our privileges and prejudices die. After those things die, we live differently because of what Jesus offers in return. That's the life we're challenged to find by taking up the cross and following him. And that new life, when we let go of everything else but Christ, we have nothing to lose. That's how a Christian lives in times like these. I was in a meeting the other day with several clergy who've been tasked by the bishop to figure out how to strengthen the anti-racist practice in our diocese. And an African-American priest in the group asked us white clergy, point blank, if we were really willing to face the consequences of speaking boldly about racial justice in a church that has had a mixed record of defense of black lives over the last 400 years. Oh yes, we quickly insisted, of course, how could we not? But he persisted. Even if you lose members, he asked. Even if your parish finances take a hit, even if your parishioners send your sermons to right-wing groups and they find out where you live, even if your family members are threatened, even then. And this is the question that the Spirit is really putting to the church today. Are we willing to face the true consequences of representing the gospel in our community, not only with our lips, but with our lives? It's not a unique question. It is the question of baptismal promise and Eucharistic offering. In fact, there is not one sacrament where we are not asked to leave an old life for a new one or reminded that's what we've committed to. Now the current cry for racial justice puts this in particular relief. It is a particularly profound example. That same black priest who challenged us white clergy also made it clear to us what the risk is like for him and his siblings of color. That on any given day, black and brown people have no guarantee that they will not lose their lives, he reminded us. Driving with a headlight out, reaching for a wallet, making a purchase, going bird watching, going jogging, walking down the sidewalk, questioning an authority, sleeping in a car, sleeping in a bed. All are occasions that have been met with deadly force against black and brown bodies. So when I'm asked, what consequences am I willing to experience as a result of working for racial justice in responding to the call of the gospel? I have to ask myself, how much of my old life as a white person am I willing to lay down? And if the answer is all of it, then I have to tell you right now that I cannot do that alone. I need help. And here is what I'm relying on. I am relying on you and your faith and your energy and your commitment to the new world that God is bringing forth right under our feet and how you pray it and find it in scriptures and how you post it on Facebook. I need that because as a member of the body of Christ, much of my faith and energy and hope is stored in you. So we need to hold that for one another. 
And I'm also relying on the nourishment found in morning prayer, in regular liturgy, whether I pray it in community or alone. And if you need that too, then let today's act of common prayer enter you like food and drink. Realize that the soul inside of you is made thirsty by all that is required of this time. Sip it slowly, savor it through the day, greet it with all the gratitude you can muster. Another word for Thanksgiving is Eucharist, bread or no bread. And I rely on that God who entices one day and dupes another and asks me to lay down all the things that might get in the way of God's kingdom. So maybe today should be called, I will, with God's help, Sunday. Amen.